Welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. Our featured guest today is Harvey Ovshinsky, a writer, producer, story consultant, educator, and public speaker. He was only 17 when he started The Fifth Estate, one of the country's oldest underground newspapers. Five years later, he became one of the country's youngest news directors in commercial radio at WABX-FM, Detroit's notorious progressive rock station. Both jobs placed him directly in the bullseye of the nation's tumultuous counterculture of the 1960s and 70s. Later, as a documentary director, his work was awarded broadcasting's highest honors, including a National Emmy, a Peabody, and the American Film Institute's Robert M. Bennett Award for Excellence. Now he's sharing the -the behind-the-scenes stories from his career in scratching the surface from Wayne State University Press. The memoir also doubles as a survival guide and an instruction manual that speaks not only to the need for storytelling and the role that endurance and resilience play in the creative process. Welcome to the podcast, Harvey. Thank you so much, Kim and Sarah. This is uh, my idea of a good time. It beats writing a book, I'll tell you. (laughs) That's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. a lot. All right. Well, let's start out with your question that you used to ask your Video Detroit producers. Why this story and why now? Yeah, like where's the fire? Yeah, what's the urgency? <laughs> because it was harder for me not to write the book as I approached my 70th birthday than it was to try and write it. As you say, I'm a documentary producer, among other things. And uh, my comfort zone, what I'm used to doing, is asking people very tough, probing um, questions that scratch their surface, get below their facade and find out what they're really thinking and what they're what's really important to them even though they may not feel like telling me on camera so but I was good at it for some reason I seem to have a knack so I did that forever and it was great and I got the awards and the honors and it was it was wonderful but I, I also felt it was a cheat um, I felt that after so many years of telling other people's stories spinning other people's yarns essentially with their threads and not mine, I thought there was a voice missing after all these years in my storytelling. And that voice was moi. So I rolled up my sleeves, got dirty, and um, and I started writing. And I haven't stopped, even though the work is done on the book. I don't think I'll ever stop writing. You started early. You started the Fifth Estate at 17. Yeah. When there are only four un- other underground renew- newspapers right. in the country. Yeah. And then you went to WABX at 21 as a news director. Yes. When you started on television, you knew nothing about how to put a piece of video together, I hear. I mean, and what did your lack of experience bring to those positions and and how do they contribute to your success in that career? Good question. Well, not in any particular order, but first a painful learning curve. When you, when you don't know what you don't know, um, it can be very ouchy. Uh, for example, in the fifth estate, um, the first issue, which I loved, I adored. I was so proud of it at age 17 and graduate of Mumford high school, little Mustangs out there. I, um, uh, I laid out my newspaper, my tabloid. The printer sent it back to us with 3,000 copies, and there were two blank pages. I I didn't get it, but I didn't know that when you publish or lay out a tabloid paper, you have eight pages. The the run can go eight pages at a time, not six. And I laid out six pages. So the printer, rather than giving me a heads up, (laughs) thought he'd teach this youngin, and he printed my first issue of the paper with two blank pages. It was a flawed masterpiece. But as my father told me, he's a scientist and inventor, he said, there's no such thing as a failed experiment. So I picked up my, you know, my training wheels, got back on the bike and uh, came out with uh, another issue. And now 55 years later, it's still publishing, although not with me. I forgot the question, but... Well, and your video as well. You learned to put together video. I've always 
dived right in. I'm not saying it's a credit to my learning style. Maybe I, maybe my mother was right. I should have stayed at Mumford when instead of publishing my own underground news magazine called The Idiom, capital I, capital D, I-O-M. Uh, I should have worked for the Mumford Mercury, a journalist. I could have become a real newspaper man. But it said, no, I dived in into doing something that I really wanted and needed to do because I was, I just needed to get my, for, for reasons which are explained in the book, especially when I set the table in the first half of the book in, in a part of the book called My First Childhood. I really find, I have, I have, I have had an urgency, the fire, to answer your other question, was to tell my story, raise my voice, tell my voice, my stories. After I feel I paid my dues, I made my deposit. I think it was time for me to see what it felt like to let my own cat out. And that's why, going back to your original question, I wrote the book and I majored in journalism for six weeks at Wayne State University while I was publishing the paper, that was the problem. I was at Monteith College majoring in journalism, but I couldn't make, I couldn't learn about G Journalism 101, Gutenberg's Bible, the history of photo offset printing, while I was editing and publishing my own newspaper. I, I couldn't do both. So I, I just decided to keep teaching myself how to do these things and work with people. What I always tell my students is you don't want to be the smartest person in the room you, you really need to, to work with people who know more than you do. You need to get out of your own way um, and um, pay attention to what you don't know as, as well as what you think you know. That's really great advice. Well, so. I, I, I took it. Um, it took me four years to write Scratching the Surface, uh, two years to write a, a bad book, <laughs> and two more years to write a good one. Because I that's think what that's really common. If you're going to scratch, if you're going to do it, <laughs> that's what it takes over and over and over again until you get it right. Even when the canvas fights back and feels like, I don't want to go there. That's too deep. That's too dark. <laughs> can't we just skip? Can't we go back to above the surface where I'm most comfortable, where not much new happens? There's no bomb shows up there. It's safe. <laughs> I said, no, no, put up or shut up. I can't ask myself to do what I, I had to ask myself to do what I, I asked my students to do ever since I started teaching fourth graders on through my graduate students. Take the plunge, take the surface and scratch it until you get to the bottom of the surface, below the surface, to where your good stuff is. Your heart and soul, the heart of your matter, whatever is important to you at the time, whatever you value, whatever... You know, my mantra was to my, when I was producing documentaries, you know, spill your beans. I, I, I'm all ears. And eventually they would. But uh, my mantra was, don't expect me to uh, spill mine. And so I, I had to, I felt like a cheat. I felt I, I had to prove something to myself yet again, because I had never written a book. <laughs> I never, hello, I think I have some, my wife. My wife would call this repetition compulsion. <laughs> She's a psychotherapist and a psychologist. But I can't help myself. I just love learning and creating new things. A lot of the work you were known for in your television days was documentary production, Absolutely. which is a little different than daily news. So yeah. TV stations didn't do a lot of docs then, and they do almost none now. You're How right. did you create those unique opportunities? And what do you think we're missing without that kind of filmmaking? Today? Well, to give Channel 4, WDIV and WXYC TV and uh, Detroit Public Television credit. Yeah, they weren't doing a lot of docs, but the executive producers and the production executives decided, you know, there's this is Detroit. Hello, <laughs> for a storyteller living and working in Detroit, it's like being a kid in a candy store, or depending on the mood or the day, a munitions store <laughs> shop. <laughs> but so anyway, they 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 hired me to help um, find those stories that were below the radar. Hello, that were below the surface, and. Um, to their credit, we they did it for years, and then I guess they decided that it was. And, and you know, they, they got it was a good uh, uh, relationship because they got the awards, they got FCC credit for serving the public good, 
but they weren't used to not putting all their money into uh, local morning shows or the six o'clock and 11 o'clock newscasts. So God bless those folks at Channel 4 and Channel 56 and WTVS for giving me and other Detroit storytellers a chance to get it off our chest. What do you think we're missing without that now? What is what oh, do you think so we're much, now? so much. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't watch the local news. I don't watch watch the local stations like I used to. Um, there's so many opportunities to see stories, stories, and even Detroit centric stories. Because I've always believed that um, if, if the work is here's the irony. I used to teach this to my students. The more specific our stories are. The, don't ask me how, but the more universal they are, you know, when our, regardless of where we live or who we are, or what our background is, when our good stuff below the surface speaks to your good stuff, we're in business. <laughs> we're in business. And so I think there are so many Detroit stories that I miss seeing, but the good news is um, the media has become so fragmented. We're not waiting for the television stations to tell our stories. You can go online, you can, it's all kinds of opportunities and websites and on Facebook uh, and, and YouTube to see these stories. I just wish that other filmmakers coming up now could experience what I did at those local stations. Because not only did we have more people tuning in and responding, not only did we have that, um, we had uh, reporters for the news and free press. Hello, full, you would never know it. Now, back in the day when I was coming up, there were full-time reporters for the news and free press to review and critique and promote the work of local storytellers. Not anymore. I miss them terribly and I feel badly because what you want to do is when you're starting out, you don't want to only tell your stories. You want to build your cred. You want to uh, have some bragging rights. You need some reviews, some awards and some feedback. And it's not just the television stations that have dropped the ball to my, in my value judgment, but also the newspapers. But then that's what the web, then they asked for it. That's what the web is for, for better or worse. That's what the web is for. Hello, look what we're doing. <laughs> I, I haven't had too many requests to talk about scratching the surface on the local television stations. But oh, I, in fairness, <laughs> the free press and news and our Detroit and WDT, everybody, I don't know what it is, but something has happened and people are very much interested in hearing not only my story in Scratching the Surface, Peter Werby's novel about his experience with me and others uh, publishing The Fifth Estate, so word gets out. If it's if it's a value, it'll find a way to get from your good stuff above the surface, so that other people can appreciate seeing and hearing it as much as you did getting it off your chest. Yeah, we certainly miss uh, newspaper coverage of literary events, and this That's is one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast. So, well, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your storytelling style because you have a great affection for cinema verite and documentaries with no narration. Yeah, uh, you, you've dubbed that the voice of God. Why do you think that's a more effective style of filmmaking? Um, and how does that okay. lack of narration impact the point of view of your stories? I'm from the Billy Wilder School of Storytelling, the famed Austrian-American director, some like it hot and, and other films, who said, you know, as a filmmaker, as a director, you don't, you can tell the audience two plus two, okay? Tell them it's two plus two, but let the viewers do the math. Write that down. You tell your viewers, your readers, two plus two, but let them do the math. So the narr my documentaries were narrated, but they were self-narrated. The people in the, the stories told their own stories without others interpreting and representing the voice of God to tell to tell the viewers what they need to know. To tell in the old days, the, the lexicon was tell your viewers. We learned this, and if I went to local television school, I would have been taught this, but I never did because there was no such thing. Tell them what you're going to tell your viewers, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. That's how producers came up in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s. So cinema verite, let the folks tell their own stories. Know how to listen, know how to ask the right questions. No, no, not, not, in my case, don't take no for an answer. 
Okay. In my case, what I wanted to know, one of the most important questions I used to teach my students and my interns was when you're in a, in a, in a producing a documentary, it's the last question should be always after you thank them for agreeing to the interview is, excuse me, tell me what you haven't told me. <laughs> Are we missing something? Tell me, can you give me an idea what we haven't talked about yet? Never fails. Well, assuming you don't accept whatever answer they give, if it's a superficial above the surface answer, if you want to go, you go farther. You don't stop. I have something called Ritamins. Oh, you're writers. You'll like this. Ritamins. I started with my fourth grade teachers, uh, students at the Gross Point Academy. I still use them. And Ritamins are like um, vitamins for writers. They're acronyms. You know, you, they're not uh, commands or orders or instructions. They're recommendations, observations, things to chew on when you're writing to make your work stronger, better, darker, deeper. Ritamin DSGF. D-S-G-F. Don't stop. Don't stop. Go further. I mean, that's, that's what, hello, that's what Scratching the Surface is about. It's what my storytelling is about. I'm not the only one. Um, I think that's what we value. I think the whole point of um, storytelling isn't just to tell what happens to the main characters. That's plot. Anybody can do that. That's 101. But you want to focus on the cathartic experience of relating to the theme of the story you're reading or watching or listening to. In other words, plot is what happens to, to the main character in a story, but theme is what your story is really about and what happens to us as viewers, as readers, as participants, as a result of going along for the main character's ride. So... Don't stop, go further. If you want to get below the surface, the plot is a below, below is the, the good stuff and you have to scratch it. You have to dig, you have to burrow. The good stuff's not going to come up and say, here I am. The world is waiting to hear what I'm thinking, how I feel, what's important to me. It doesn't work that way. And I'm not saying the world cares less about what you have to say. That's a risk real or perceived writers and creative people, right? Have to take. So, but if you want to go there, if it's harder not to go there, harder not to scratch and spill your beans and let the cat out than it is to tr at least try. I mean, isn't that why we're here? I, Sarah and Kim, isn't that why we're here? I love it. Who, who, who wouldn't want to dive in? Who wouldn't want to scratch? I mean, that's where the, that's, that's the pleasure I'm not saying the good stuff is always feeling good or it's happy or, or it's gay or it's sometimes it's sad and painful and difficult and sorrowful, but it's real. That's how you know you're alive. You, you want to feel alive. You got to get out of the surface and go below and then mix it up. I'm not saying we have to spend all our time digging and scratching. And, you know, you, you, the surface, is, I love it. The, the surface is a nice place to visit. I'm happy to, I just don't want to live. I can't live there. As a, as a human being, as a storyteller, I just, I don't know what the question was. I hope I'm helping you, helping me, help me figure it out. I'm still well, pondering. Do you think, I wrote yeah, the do you think sometimes it's scratching the surface is helping people figure things out? Is that part of the process? Well, no, figure things out about how they feel and what they think, what's important, and then making a decision, is it worth trying to express it or let, let it off your chest and share it? Share what's going on below there. The thing about this, the good stuff, it's lonely out there. It's lonely out there. We, we, it, it's it, when you're hiding, when you're avoiding the surface. One of the exercises I did, other than this infamous scratching the surface exercise, which I did, uh, which I talked about at the beginning of the of the book, um, I took my fourth grader that said, "Team, <laughs> what's this?" And they said, "Well, Mr. O, uh, it looks like skin to me." And uh, I said, yes, it is. Great observation. Now let's reflect. Skin, what does it do? It protects, they would tell me, it's the largest organ in the body. It protects what's inside, <laughs> what's below. Hello, it's surface. Can you imagine, youngins, what would happen? Because we don't have much practice doing this in our lives, except in my class. And even then, one day we woke up and metaphorically, we shed our skin, our outer self our surface. Can you imagine what happened to all that good stuff that's buried 
below the bones and within the muscles. So all, if we spilled our guts that were held within by the skin, to anyone and everyone, regardless if they could care less. And then I got up and they, they didn't know. I said, well, oh, actually they did. They got the, they got the joke. They, we all got up to answer the question. You can't see it now, but they took the heel of their shoe and they squashed, they squashed their good stuff, splat. Because they know there's, there's some risk involved. We have no practice spilling our beans, getting it off our chest, sharing our experiences, thinking that no one cares about what's important to us. Now, I set the table in the beginning of the book because in my first childhood, I talk about the origins of my need to do this, to get it off my chest, to spill my beans. Because I, I just, I wasn't going to keep that up anymore. So there it is. Well, throughout the book, you also sprinkle scenes written in a screenplay format. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose that? And what was it that you were trying to achieve creatively using that? Well, that's a good question. Form? Well, for one thing, it was a natural way for me to express myself. I was a screenwriter and, um, and still am. And so it was easy to take the documentary, the best bites, as we used to call them, of the documentaries, or memories and recollections and dreams from my childhood and uh, not only write it in block paragraph blocks, but to express it with character names and character parenthetical actions and just the way screenplays are written. And it just it just felt like an effective way to break up the and then itis. Um, in my fourth grade, I used to touch my students' foreheads and say, oh, "You know, uh, Daryl, are you okay?" Uh, well, sure, Mister O, I'm fine. Are you okay? I say, yeah, I am, but I'm feeling a sense that you've got a, a case of and then itis because this four, young fourth grader, the the bunny got in the rocket, and then the bunny took off, and then the bunny got, you know, flew to Mars, and then the bunny got married, and then the bunny had children. You know, there were no roses to smell. And then itis. And I don't know why I brought up and then itis, speaking of going to Mars, but I think there's an answer to your question somewhere there. If you want to remember, remind me what it was, I'll be happy to tie it up for you, unless it's obvious. <laughs> Oh, yes. You, you, you got there. But yes, if you want to tie it up, it was about screenplay right. format and what you were trying to achieve yeah. in terms so of So I found the, that well. it was a, a way to break up the density of the copy of the text of my stories in a way that I found very interesting. Plus, for emphasis, there's something called parenthetical actions. Now, in, in screenplays, directors hate them. Actors despise them. But writers, especially first-time writers, love them. You know, when a character says... Um, well, I'm feeling awfully hungry uh, today, uh, Kim and Sarah. Um, I wish we could uh, have something to eat and take a break first. Beat, the word beat in parentheses. Um, but I'm afraid if I do, I'll throw up. I mean, that's a bad example. That's a terrible example. I can give you one from the book if you want to edit that terrible one out. Okay, that's a horrible example. Shame on you, Mr. O. You need to go back to school. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your style in the book because you are fluent in many different styles of writing. And so in news and documentary writing, the language is usually simple and straightforward. And so how do you elevate that kind of story to give it a poetic quality while you're still using the right language for your medium? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that other than to use it as a, an excuse to talk about my learning style and therefore my writing style. Um, I, I, as a young child, I, it was nuanced and undiagnosed. I had a learning disability where uh, I couldn't process uh, verbal language. If, if the language is verbal, if the communication was a verbal only, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't retain it. So I learned at an early age how to speak and write figuratively. Idioms, maxims, <laughs> uh, similes, analogies. I mean, I hope I didn't overwhelm my, <laughs> my readers, but I also think that figurative language can be very demonstrative and visual and, and three-dimensional and um, can do a lot to bridge the gap between the top of the surface and below. 
So I don't know if that answers the question, but I love being reminded that I write figuratively. Those are all um, great poetic devices. Well, it, it works for me. I, I had no choice. I, I've, I've managed to control it. <laughs> Sometimes I have to put my, my, my figurative phasers on stun. My editor said, you know, Harvey, we get it. <laughs> we get it. Let's pull back. Less is more. Less is more. So there's a combination of a lot of good stuff, figuratively as well as literally. But also in terms of a memoir, writing a memoir, I didn't want it to be to, to, to tell only the literal truth. It wasn't just the literal truth of my life. It was the um, emotional truth, not just what happened in my childhood and in my professional lives, but how it felt to experience that. And my experience has been that figurative language helps put the reader in your place. And as a documentary producer, I'll give you an example. Um, we did a, a video for the Thaw Fund, the Thaw Fund. It was a, a, prof, a nonprofit aimed at raising money to help working poor people stay warm in the summer, in the winter. And my interest says, well, it's, how are you going to uh, sh show uh, cold? I said, well, we're not going to show cold. What? Mr. O, uh, no offense, but that's your job, our job. Well, we're going to show it, of course, but we're also going to make you feel the gold. So I decided to open up the video with a white screen, a whole white screen, and you're scratching. <laughs> wow, I must be preoccupied. Scratching and uh, scraping across the windshield that's covered with snow and ice. And slowly, because we all know what this feels like, the camera's in the front seat watching this white scrape away. And you just felt it. So the concept of figurative language has been important to me, not only as a writer, but as a documentary producer. How can we not only show as well as tell, but how can we feel as well as, 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 as tell? Let me give you another, another example. Um, my company, production company, HKO Media, was pretty successful. It was a small one man plus interns band, uh, very successful because we had a knack you know, in screenplay writing, there's something called the touch. The touch is what happens when it's what characters do to express themselves or just visually or to, if they, whatever they say or do to express their personality or their character traits. The most obvious example, go back to the West Wing, one of my favorite series where Toby Ziegler <laughs> had this squishy ball and he'd hardball. He'd throw it against the wall, told you everything you know about how uptight and wound up. Toby was. That was his touch. We got to know him that way. Okay. So touches are important. HKO Media, my company's touch was to show, feel, don't just tell, but also to emphasize what, are, especially for the nonprofits and the corporate clients, what their products and services, not what just they were about, but what they were really about. In other words, plot versus theme. Plot versus, don't tell me it it's raining, doctoral, E.L. doctoral said about the writing process. Tell me what it feels like to experience the rain falling on you. Don't tell me it's raining. Anybody can do that. That's above the surface stuff. Tell me what it feels like to experience the rain. Yeah, and then you had me on hello. So I'm pretty consistent, I think, with the documentary story. Maybe it wasn't as hard as it sh I made it sound because the writing is figurative and the work was figurative, dem demonstrative. Certainly when I taught, it was Lord knows figurative. Write like a river, I would tell my students. Don't, don't write like a lake. <laughs> write like a river, don't write like a lake. Anyway, thanks for getting me started. I haven't talked about, I've been writing about it, but I haven't talked about it in a while. Excellent, so I'm glad that we have this opportunity. Um, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Today, everybody has access to a media platform and everybody can tell stories, even in video, which is yeah. you know, a, a relatively new thing for human beings. Um, what kind of impact do you think that will have on the kinds of stories we choose to tell and the way that we tell them? Well, I'm hoping it won't impact on the kind of stories we tell. I think we, the good stuff, if it's important to you, I think there's a way to make it important to other people. I think that's what catharsis is about in literary language, when, when what happens to the main character feels like it's happening to you. So I think 
what we do or it, it, to me, I'm not a snob. I, I don't, I, I'm not, a, I, um, I didn't care if it was radio or television or screenwriting or video production or teaching. I just couldn't, um, I couldn't stop, you know, getting it off my chest. So I wasn't fussy. My grandson, Toby, used to love crayons and then he discovered chalk and then finger painting. He's like his Napa. <laughs> He's not fussy. So I don't think the medium is as important as the message. The first most important first rule of storytelling, I used to tell my students, and I've got dozens of first most important first rules, is to have something to say. Hello, have something to say. Content, vitamin C for content. Okay, and then find a way that works best for you to get it off your chest. And then if you need a living, uh, to answer your question, to earn a living doing it, which is the bottom line, Take your good stuff and find a, find someone who has a personal or professional interest or stake in either your success or the success of your subject matter. I'll say this again, whether it's an individual or an organization or an institution, share your good stuff once you make sure it's good enough and you've reworked it over and over again because you can't go to the well too often until it's, you can't take it out of the oven too soon. And then I forgot my, I was, my point. I was going to reinforce the point. <laughs> you know, all these pictures are in my head and sometimes the analogies just get in the way of my mouth. Teaching is obviously really important to you. And in the book, you say that creativity can't be taught. And Fran Leibowitz says the same thing about talent. Yes. Is there a difference between creativity and talent? And how do you recognize that in either a coworker or a student? Well, I think creativity and talent are two different things. I think you can be extremely creative and not be very good at it, but it can be very satisfying for you. If you want to get good at it, you, you have to take the steps necessary to, to learn from others who know more about it than you do. So I, I think creativity, I don't think can be taught. I think you either have it or you don't. The potential, the seedlings for it, you know, but you can certainly model creativity. And that in the classroom, that's all I did. I modeled creativity. I created imaginary teaching aids, muses, imaginary, you know, uh, animal spirit guides, you know, Wanda the wild goose, the wild and wacky free associator, the rough drafter, the sloppy copier, and then ponder the polar bear who, uh, who really uh, thought twice and then again and again and organized his thoughts and wasn't afraid to be patient and let it come to him. And then of course there was uh, Shredder who lived in a wastebasket. My students never knew what Shredder looked like, but they loved tossing their rough drafts, their sloppy copies, <laughs> as if it were a basketball game, into Shredder's, uh, Shredder's open mouth. And of course, my favorite, and my, my students, my students just to love, to hate, uh, yes, but, yes, but, Y-E-Z-Z-B-U-T-T, -T. yes, but. You know, yes, but is this inner uh, judge, jury, and executioner in every Buddy, but especially creative people, artists, you know, who we think no matter how good we think it is, it's not good enough. Oh, very good, Harvey. I could hear yes, but over my shoulder as I was finishing the book. You know, that's a real good effort. Yes, but you're not going to hand it in, are you? I wish I could remember what your questions were. They're great oh. questions because I'm just off and running. Well, how do you recognize creativity or talent in a coworker or a student? When it works. Oh, here's an example. Carl Biedemann, who wrote an award-winning, was reviewed in the New York Times documentary that I executive produced at WTVS, Detroit Public Television. Uh, it was called Miracle on Fort Street, all about these uh, civilians who were learning how, from scratch, to sing Handel's Messiah and the struggle that that was. Okay, I needed a producer because I was the director of production. I needed someone to take the ball and run with it. And Carl... Worked for Focus Hope. He did produce videos for Focus Hope in Detroit. And he applied for the job. And I said, well, show me what you've done. So he showed me a video he did about the uh, Meals on Wheels at Focus Hope. It was terrible by my standards. I mean, I, you know, it was, no offense, Carl, and he knows how I feel. It was fine for what it was. But he, he asked an old man who had been interviewing, a pretty 
mediocre interview, but Carl asked the man, the old man, could I see what's inside your refrigerator? And suddenly my EKG level started getting a little high. Uh, and the man opened up his refrigerator. He was a little embarrassed, but he opened it up. And there was a couple of carrot sticks, a glass of milk, you know, maybe some lettuce. Broke my heart. Hired him on the spot. <laughs> Paid him less than he was earning at Focus Hope. And uh, so I think there's, you don't have to, you don't have to be good all the time. All your work has, doesn't, isn't great or a masterpiece coming out, especially when you're young and learning. But Carl made the decision to learn. He knew he needed help. He knew he wanted to be better than he was. And he asked for help. When I was young, I wrote to Rod Serling. I was 13 years old. My, my hero was the Twilight, the creator of the Twilight Zone. And I wanted to know, how did, how did you become you? I want to learn from you. Uh, I wanted to be Harvey Ifshinsky to Carl Biedemann's, him to be, to, 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 to Carl Biedemann, to me. And, and he wrote back and he told me, he told me what I had to do to learn how to write. And the first thing he said, the first most important first rule is to have a, not just a passion, but a need to write and don't stop. Write, 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 write. And don't just study writing in school because writing encompasses the whole Megillah. Learn about the world and everyone and everything in it, and that will be just for your writer's mill. So to answer your question, I think you have to um, look for clues for creativity and of creativity and go from there. And in the case of my students, they were jammed full of clues, but they knew they didn't know what they were doing entirely. That's what, that's what writing, I used to tell my students, you know, you don't have to know what you're talking about before you start writing. They were delighted to hear that. But I wrote in the class board, <laughs> you don't have to know what you're talking about before you start writing. That's what writing is for. Hello, you don't have to know what you're talking about before you start writing. That's what writing is for. And that's how we learn, by doing it and by asking for help and learning from others and giving it away and doing whatever it takes to improve the quality of the work. And don't take it personally when you screw up. Everyone's going to have two pages blank <laughs> out of their tabloid career as storytellers. It's going to happen. Ask Thomas Edison how many bulbs he destroyed en route to discovering the light bulb. So the thing about the surface, interesting. It's tough. It's, it's, it's like a wall. It's like, it's difficult. So you have to really work at it and practice diligently and uh, don't take no for an answer and uh, wipe the blood off your nose when you hit the wall and just keep coming back to it. And eventually it won't let you in. That's your job to go through it, to scratch it, to get to the good stuff, yours and others. But nobody said it was going to be easy, especially if you want to be good. Now, if you don't want to be good, Take half of what I've said and don't even pay any attention. It's not true. I have a 60, 40% rule in my classroom. 60% of what I say is true. It's brilliant. You should write it down. 40% is bullshit. I have no idea if this applies to you and your specific experience or project. Only you know. The problem is I don't know the 60 from the 40. So I'm saying if you want to be good, take what I've what we're talking about, your questions and my answers, literally, figuratively, if it helps. But if you don't care, if you don't give a damn, eh, don't worry about it. Knock yourself out. How's that working for you? But I've never been a fan. See, I've never been a fan of writing for its own sake. I'm not one of those people who, when the log falls in the forest, I'm content not to hear it. <laughs> I, I, When I was young, I published the... Uh, the Creative Voice Club newsletter. I was says, 10 years old. <laughs> and later on, the Transylvanian newsletter, you know, because I, writing was important to me. I valued it. But publishing was the point. For me, sharing, sharing my stories, my voice, my feelings, my good stuff with others, that was the point. So half the battle is getting off your chest. The other half is finding the courage to share your good stuff with others. And I'm not saying that's easy. Hello, four years. But this is, that's what it takes if you want to be good, if you want to scratch the surface. If you don't care, don't worry about it. 
I just don't know how to create in any other way. Sharing seems to be an important part of the process that makes it the story real, right? I mean, is that kind of what you feel Yeah, about? yeah. I, I wrote a children's, for my fourth graders, I wrote a story called, Have You Seen Pendragon's Fire? And Pendragon, poor Pendleton, he, you know, it, the breathing of his fire was not the problem. He could breathe the fire. He just didn't want to show his fire to anyone. Now, that's a problem if you're a dragon, especially if you're a pen dragon, the most powerful and mightiest of all the dragons. So it's not enough that you breathe your fire, knock yourself out. But if you want to have an impact, if you want to make a difference, if you want to matter in the world, you want to find a way to show and share your fire. And here's the best part. You'll live to tell about it. You'll live to tell about it. What can they do to you? Nothing worse than not even trying. Nothing's worse than just giving up before you even start because you're afraid. Ooh, ooh, the good stuff. Ooh, the surface, you know, uh, scratching. That doesn't, this doesn't work. Or not. Do, as Yoda used to say, <laughs> no, don't try. Do or don't, do or don't do. <laughs> there is no this, try. This isn't, uh, I'm not creating a value judgment here. It's fine with me if, if you can't get beyond it. But I know what it took for me to do that from early childhood, and I can't stop sharing, which is why I wrote the book. I'm not teaching as much as I used to. Why I wrote the book, because there's a lot to learn. But one of the greatest compliments from um, Desiree Cooper, who used to write for the Free Press, Pulitzer Prize-nominated writer, said the great thing about Harvey's book is that it's a, it's a bio text. It's, it's a biography, but it's also a, a textbook. As you said in your introduction, Kim, um, a survivor's guide, a manual. I'm not asking anyone who reads the book to try anything that I haven't learned or accomplished the hard way. I wasn't always Harvey Evshinsky. Well, I was, but it wasn't pretty. That took a while. Well, speaking of sharing, yes. you end the book by saying you don't know what story you're going to tell next, but you're ready. Has a new project captured your attention yet? Has something new come along? Not really, because uh, my best friend, Michael Kerman, used to say, Harvey, when I used to whine and I lament about, oh, I'm a radio guy, I'm a TV guy, I'm a screenwriter, I'm a teacher, I'm a video producer. You know, I used to feel a little funny about the, the Leonard Bernstein in me. Maybe I should focus. And he said, relax, Harvey, lighten up. You know, when was the last time you ever did anything twice? So to answer your question, it's a good question. I don't think I want to write another book. Maybe a play, hello. Maybe we'll write, she'll, maybe Pendragon's Fire. I'll take it out of my drawer and that'll be a children's story. Or maybe we'll talk to one of the local theaters about either dramatizing for children Pendragon's Fire. Or maybe, or maybe some parts, maybe my first childhood would make a play. I've never written a play before. That'd be fun. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think anything but a book. I am going to spend a lot of time for the next month getting the schools, high schools and colleges, the teachers to read this and see what part of this can they include in their curriculum. And as a teacher, I know the answer, but I want them to tell me it's their class, not mine. In terms of inspiring and teaching the storytellers, regardless of the medium, journalists or filmmaking or digital media or, or whatever. Um, so my focus to answer your question really is to get it in, into the classrooms. And uh, that would give me a great deal of pleasure. You know, it's, it's just an example of a log. I don't want this log to stay in the forest. That's why I was so grateful. I didn't hesitate to say yes. What Kim and Sarah all right in Sin City want to talk to me. I'm there. Another opportunity, another excuse. Well, that is the greatest of segues, and you're obviously the master of that. Uh, would you like to read some of your work for our listeners? Here's something that should be interesting to you. There was a time when I lamented being a Detroit storyteller, a film, a Detroit filmmaker. I used to whine, well, am I, I'm better than that. <laughs> why, um, you know, I, why, I'm more than that. And then I decided that Pigeonholes are for pigeons. That's the name of what I'll read to you, okay? I once asked my father, the scientist, inventor, fellow who created nickel metal hydride batteries that created, helped make possible hydrogen and, battery, and electric cars and, and solar cells that printed by the mile. Google him. 
He's more famous than I am, a lot more. Okay, I once asked my father why he didn't pack up his alternative energy company and move to Silicon Valley. Dad had his reasons for staying, among them what he called the, quote, freedom, excitement, and dynamism he found in his adopted city. Not one for false modesty, my father was also determined to see his sea-changing hydrogen storage and nickel battle, battery hydride uh, technology save, in his words, the auto industry from itself. My own reasons for staying were less altruistic. Most artists are infatuated with their models, inspired by their charm, their beauty and splendor, not me. Although I've always identified with my hometown's wounds, its brokenness. In my mind, that was always my city's sizzle, not at stake. Nobel Prize winning Yiddish writer Isaac Bashevis Singer used to say that every writer needs an address. Every writer needs an address. For me, living and working in a city like Detroit, so famous for its genetically encoded apocalyptic resistant survival gene, has been great practice for me for how to endure the tumultuous peaks and valleys and challenges that come from attempting to live a creative life. Still, there was a time when I actively resisted being called a Detroit filmmaker. Pigeonholes are for pigeons, I told myself, metaphorically speaking. I, I was concerned that the label might mark me as being simply a one-trick pony, a musician who only knew how to play one note, tell only one kind of story. It's not an unfamiliar issue for artists to stay true to their own passions and are guided by the glow of their own North Star. I've been told that maybe I shouldn't focus on race so much, Brooklyn artist Alexandra Bell told the New York Times about her reputation for creating only mixed media works that worked, quote, against the dominant narrative put forth in the news. Art people, she said, trying to get me to diversify my work so I won't be seen as the race girl in the art world. Bell's success, I wrote, with what some critics called her preoccupation, was heartening, but it was Detroit crime novelist Elmore Leonard who helped me snap out of it. For years, Hollywood producers teased Leonard about his insistence on not moving to Los Angeles like everybody else did in those days. Eventually, they stopped bothering me, he told me, because they figured, well, maybe he knows something we don't. Thank you. I wasn't planning on reading that, but I'm happy to. <laughs> this has been great. Oh, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. Well, one last question, Harvey. What have we missed? Is there anything that we've missed asking you about? Uh, oh, my God. No one. And I've done dozens of these. No one has asked me that. Can I, can I think about it? Because that's really below the surface. I, you know, here's... Not, not to pat myself on the back. I think I've, I think I've spilled my guts in the book. And in answering your questions and other people's questions, I don't think I'm holding anything back. There's no varnish for me to unpeel. Um, I was pretty, pretty direct, pretty candid, and pretty revealing in the book. And you've read the book, so you know what I'm talking about. Because I don't think I'm holding anything back. If anything, I'm probably telling you and others both in these media experiences and in the book more than they were expecting. Because I'll be honest with you, I was pretty much, a, 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 before writing the book, a mystery. People heard about me, knew about me, my work, my, uh, um, my outside voice was passionate and energetic and uh, free form and nonstop. But my inner voice, for reasons revealed, hello, in the first half of Scratching the Surface, my first childhood, I had a good reason for uh, zipping it up. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but it was not easy for me to find my words. Well, finding the words on paper became easy in the Creative Boys Club newsletter, the Transylvania newsletter, in the Coffee Crusader, my junior high school newspaper. Words on paper were magic. Not so the ones I tried to say out loud. I got nowhere fast speaking my truth out loud. Those days are over. But if I can remember a better answer to your question, Kim and Sarah, I'll be glad to tell you what I didn't tell you. But I love the question. That's, nobody is, I mean, that's a great question. You should do this for a living. <laughs> 
so should you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I think, I think about that. <laughs> thank you, thank Harvey. You. Well, thank you. This has been a delight. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.